Today I want us to ask ourselves, why are we learning about the structure of higher level languages? What does this mean? Um, I felt like it was better suited to have uh, this discussion in the middle of the semester, because at this point you have uh, a better understanding of what uh, functional programming is, and um, our discussion is going to center a bit about functional programming. So first of all, um, I want us to cover these four questions. Why should we learn about the fundamental concepts in uh, programming languages? Why should we learn different programming languages? Why should you focus on functional programming language uh, or functional programming? And why use Racket at all? Um, of course, most of these disclaimers, uh, most of these claims that I'm making are just opinions, my own opinion. Um, but they will give you just an intuition of things. Some of them are not uh, opinions, they're facts. So we'll go through a few of those. Uh, again, finally, we're not trying to, I'm not trying to say that functional programming is the answer, and it certainly is not. Uh, usually you want to use a language that better suits whatever you're doing. And we'll cover that as well in this video. Okay, so uh, first is the main point, what I was just talking about before, languages are just tools. Um, so you should learn the language that is more appropriate to what you're doing. Um, there are There is no best programming language, as theoretically they are equivalent, as we'll see, uh, and as you may know. Um, and different languages favor different uh, things, different domains. So for instance, you know that if you are doing uh, programming language research, most people use functional programming languages. Uh, if you're doing any kind of uh, high performance computing, then you're certainly using C or Fortran. Uh, and it's just because it's, there's more of an ecosystem, maybe the program, the execution model maps, whatever problems people are thinking about at the moment. Um, and in the end, the programming language is, is just a computing interface, right? It's it's trying to give meaning and primitives that allow you to uh, operate or interact with a certain computing device. Um, so you can also think of it as an interface, uh, a human interface to a computation model. So it doesn't need to be hardware per se, it could just be um, a certain computation model. Um, finally, we're also going to cover the importance of first class functions and avoiding mutation, uh, which I covered already a bit, but I want to just reemphasize that. Okay, so first of all, why should we care about language semantics? Um, and uh, the idea of understanding semantics, which is the most, the biggest focus on this course, I hope you uh, realize and appreciate that, is really trying to understand uh, concepts of programming language in terms of features. And then I also want to give you an understanding of how we could implement such feature, uh, so that you understand a bit more deeply in more detail, uh, how each feature makes sense. Uh, each feature um, has a certain behavior, behavior is equivalent to uh, semantics in this in this context. So there's also an emphasis on um, trying to specify semantics in an unambiguous and precise way, which is why I've been, uh, this course has a ha very heavy focus on mathematical specification of uh, programming languages. Um, and this is, as you might imagine, very important if um, you want to implement it, right? So so that I can transmit what I want you to understand in a very precise way, so that there are no bugs. But similarly, um, because semantics define a software contract, right, the execution of something, imagine you you write a library, the way that library works, that's the semantics, that is, um, that has to be understood by the client of the library. And it you need to maintain that um, behavior, right? So in a way, there is a in 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 the contract with the client of your library uh, by making clear what is the semantics, what is the execution model, what is the computational model, 
um, you are making concrete and obvious to the client what are the requirements and the assumptions so that if everything anything is broken you know on which side the fault lays um, another thing that i want you to understand is a lot of these patterns that you're learning they are transferable knowledge they appear in multiple programming languages a lot of them appear in java java has lambdas java has um now it's going to have uh, pattern matching and so on things that we will learn in this course uh, notions of immutability so all of these things uh, they appear in multiple languages um, most programming languages they end up absorbing uh, features that are introduced in more exotic programming languages um, so all of these things may matter to you and you may encounter them throughout your uh, your um, future as a practitioner of software engineering um, okay uh, and so they don't they're not tied to a particular programming language is what I'm trying to say or a particular technology it's really about understanding the principles so that you can maybe even re-implement them in your favorite programming language okay so now let's think about how are languages similar and um, there are two ways right the first one is um, if you think about the input-output behavior, any programming language is implementable in another programming language. So you can use programming language, let's say Java, to implement C, and vice versa. So essentially, all programming languages are equivalent, um, and that is actually the Church-Turing thesis. Um, and all programming languages are equivalent to Lambda Calculus, without numbers even. Um, so those are the the few the, the, the couple of rules that you've learned uh, for homework four the first um, the first exercise although they're both equivalent the first the just those two rules are sufficient to implement all programming languages or anything that is equivalent to to lambda calculus of course there are more limited programming languages or sorry more limited languages which are not considered programming languages Okay, so another thing that is important is that there are, as I was talking about before, there is a practical practicality or, or more uh, the idea that certain features, they appear across multiple programming languages, uh, such as um, the, the idea that you have to have variables, the idea that you have to be able to abstract, the, the idea that you have to be able to reuse uh, computational modules, uh, which can be in terms of a function or even in terms of a class. Um, the idea of where you you have to have this idea of recursive definitions. Uh, that means a definition where you have to call itself like a recursive function or you know, a class that calls itself like a linked list. Um, so there are a lot of fundamentals that appear over and over uh, in all programming languages and some that appear in many programming languages, such as functions, right? Uh, even if they're not first-class functions. Okay, so how are uh, programming languages different? Um, first of all, I want to clarify that um, a language, uh, usually people think about the difference between programming languages in terms of speed or um, you know, runtime speed. So you say, oh, this language is fast or this language is slow. Uh, that is usually what people mean, or what people mean is the implementation of that language is fast or the implementation of that language is slow. It's not the language itself. C itself is not fast or slow. Python is not fast or slow. It's really the implementations of each of these languages that make, that, that, that is what people are referring to when they say a certain language is fast or slow. Um, it is true, however, that certain computational models, and therefore certain languages, languages, again, are, are uh, interfaces of computational models, are more amenable to implement efficiently. So let's think, let's think about this. For instance, if you have um, a GPU device, which is a very uh, specific, it has a very specific computation model, if you have a language that maps the hardware as close as possible, then you, of course, you get the benefits from that. So in this case, for instance, NVIDIA, they have their own GPUs. Um, 
and they have a programming API that allows you to write programs that are really fast. So if you use the language that was designed to write programs for that hardware, of course, it's going to be very fast because it's going to be, there's not a lot of, there's not of a big gap between what you're writing and uh, what the computer understands. Um, okay. So how are, um, how different languages behave in different contexts? So let's think a bit about that. So for instance, let's think about C. And people usually say, oh, C is very close to metal. That's why it's fast. Um, so people think that, going back to what I was saying, like in terms of GPUs, where you can have a language that is very close to the design of um, the, the hardware, people usually perceive C as something like that. But in fact, it's not really true because, first of all, C runs in almost all hardware. So how could it be designed to match the execution model of all hardware. It's not really the case. Um, also, you have to think again, because the language depends on the on the implementation. So which compiler are we referring to? Uh, and in fact, the reason that most C implementations are fast is because most C implementations, aka compilers are really old. They're really old pieces of software. Uh, C has been around for a long, long time. So there's a lot of accumulated knowledge knowing how to optimize C. So therefore, implementing, um, you know, like GCC has been around for a long time. LLVM has not, but it uses a lot of uh, optimizations and has been in development for a while now, for more than uh, 10 years, I imagine. I actually don't know when it was created. Uh, but there is a lot of engineering there, a lot of man hours in, in that software. And that's the that's how you get uh, really fast compilers. Um, and also there's a lot of accumulated knowledge on how to write a C compiler. Uh, so C is fast because it's, it's a language that hasn't changed much. The complexity hasn't changed much in terms of language features. So that it remains really stable. So things that uh, techniques that still mattered maybe 30 years ago still matter now. Um, the way you optimize C hasn't changed much. Um, of course, modulo hardware, of course. Um, additionally, there's also a, a set of good practice on how to write C code that is very easy to optimize. And a key uh, example of this would be in high performance computing, where uh, people write a C dialect. And by this, I mean, it's, it's, it's C, but just the way it's written is so that so that it matches the actual compiler that they're using. So it, it's always the program is bound to that compute compiler. And if you run it in another computer, another compiler, it might not run as fast as uh, originally uh, considered. Um, Okay, and there's a there's a nice paper on exactly this idea of uh, C not being understood as a low level language, and why is that? Uh, you might want to read if you're interested. Um, another thing that people that you may have heard if you've used Python, for instance, is why is Python slow multi-threading? Um, and the reason is well, the main implementation of Python in this case, C Python. Um, has um, what is known as the global interpreter lock, aka um, Gil or Jill. Um, and this is just a, a design characteristic, and in this case, flaw, that limits um, parallel execution of Python programs. And essentially, whenever you have a, a program, a multi threaded program, it is going to run. Uh, it's not going to use all the cores that your uh, computer might have available to it. The only way to parallelize Python is by creating multiple copies of the same program and running it in parallel and communicating via uh, process communication. But not, you don't have access to multi-threading. Uh, and this is all, you know, because of C Python. If you think about Jiten, for instance, which runs on Java, it doesn't have that problem and it will runs much faster. So again, it, it's related to the, um, to the um, implementation. And the key point that you might want to make is if you want to do comp compute bound parallel codes, maybe you shouldn't use Python, maybe use some, or C Python is what I'm trying to say, maybe use some C compiler. Uh, 
uh, try to write your code. And in fact, that's what a lot of people do. And that's, for instance, if you're familiar with Python, why NumPy is fast is because the, the compute heavy part of the code is written in C and then exposed into Python. Uh, it's a very common technique. Uh, there's a discussion of on the global interpreter lock and its problems and why it's super difficult to change that uh, in the Python wiki if you're interested. Um, but there are other programming languages that might be more interesting for other uh, for specific problems. For instance, if you have any kind of uh, constraint solving problem, you might want to look into programming languages such as Prolog, uh, or uh, there are some fram frameworks as well for existing programming languages. And they, like, they let you, basically they have this domain specific language to define certain problems. So in this case, constraint related problems. So in this case, we have um, uh, the, the problem of send more money and you want to figure out each very, each letter uh, is assigned to a certain number and you don't know what, what it is that. And the idea is how do you know, you know, which uh, each letter as send more money has um, each what is the number associated to each letter? Basically, that's that's what the problem is asking. Um, you want to know how much money <laughs> is being sent, so or you should send, um, and you can use actually programming language design just to figure out these these kinds of problems, constraint solving. It's not a very obvious problem to solve in C or in Java, but if you use um, either a DSL or a programming language, just built to kind of solve these problems, it's trivial. Um, so yeah, basically the key point, the key takeaway that I want to make is that some problems have uh, programming languages that were just designed for that. So they they are heavily optimized and, and it's a better use of your time to just learn the, the language and, and try to um, solve your problem using the different language. So how are languages different? In, in summary, um, the implementation matters uh, and certain programming models match certain um, problems better and certain domains require certain technology, certain programming languages. So for instance, if you are going to do machine learning, uh, maybe you want to use uh, either, you know, Python has a lot of libraries such as TensorFlow and PyTorch and so on. So you might just want to use Python because it has a, a, a more, uh, more options. And there's a lot of, you know, if you have your favorite algorithm that you want to implement, maybe it's already implemented in Python. So if you learn Python, you'll, you'll have access to that trove of knowledge, um, which you wouldn't if you want to use, I don't know, like Rust or something. Um, so all these three things, they, they do matter for when you're, you have a problem that you want to choose. It's like, what implementation do you have available of the certain language? Does the model match the problem, the programming model of the language? And three, uh, does the domain that I'm interested in um, is good or, or is a fit for the certain programming language I'm interested in. Um, and why should you learn different programming languages? Um, there's this really cool book called The Pragmatic Programmer where the one of the premises is you should learn uh, a new programming, programming language every year. Uh, and really is, there are a few, I don't know if you should learn every year, but certainly there are a lot of uh, programming languages that they unlock something in the way you think in terms of programming. So for me, it was, first it was Prolog, which I showed you before in this slide. Uh, this is Prolog. Um, another one was um, the first functional programming language, which I learned, which was Haskell. Um, also unlocked something for me. It made me understand uh, programming in a different way. And it made me a better programmer in uh, Python and Java, which were the languages I was familiar with before. So um, I've learned, whenever I learned a new language, like for instance, Python, I've learned uh, things that I used in Java when I came back. Uh, and similarly with, with Haskell and, and Prolog as well. So it's just to say that different languages, because they expose you to a different, you have different ways of express, expressing a problem, it forces you or in, uh, frame puts you in a certain frame uh, of mind where you have to rethink the problem and maybe and maybe you get used to it and and when you get used to it you kind of unlock this other point of view 
which might be important and might influence you in how you um, use your favorite programming language. Additionally, uh, if you know multiple programming languages, same as multiple fe uh, technologies, you will be uh, more employable, right? Because <laughs> there are more things that you can try to do, uh, which might be a good thing, especially when you're starting. Um, so in certain technology, uh, certain fields of industry, there are certain different requirements. So as we went back, uh, as we know, for uh, to choose a certain programming language, where was it? Um, the implementation mattered, the model matters, and the domain matters, right? So there's like these three variables. And if you ha know multiple languages, you have more degrees of freedom and, and you can move uh, better. Right? You, you have more freedom of movement in terms of um, finding jobs. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit about why uh, functional programming matters. So uh, we talked right in the beginning that functional programming means multiple things as for multiple people. Uh, but here I want to talk a bit about mutation or the idea of immutability, which is not the main characteristic, but functional programming encourages it. And also the idea of using functions as values that can be passed in, in functions or it can be stored in data structures and so on. Um, so why should we care? Um, first of all, I think, especially with mutation, uh, being, being able to constrain or think of being very careful with how and when you mutate your data structures, um, lends itself to designing more correct and elegant and efficient software. So this is a very important thing to learn. And that is why in this course, I really like the I really like to push you guys to never use mutation. Okay. You can wreck it does have mutation, but I ask you to try to think without it. You know, it's like Twitter, you have few characters to write, you you're more creative. <laughs> and this is the point really, is uh, by learning how to use immutability, I hope to help you uh, thinking about mutability in your future work, and trying to be more uh, wary and uh, thoughtful of it. Um, another thing that happens is functional programming is heavily favored by programming language researchers, which means that basically almost all features that you've used in your favorite programming language, it actually derived from a functional programming language. So you're kind of like peering into the future, if you will. Um, functional programming is also closer to uh, mathematical formalism, um, that is uh, usually the case. And if you look at, for instance, the slides and the, how I've been formalizing um, some of the algorithms, you can see that it's almost like a one-to-one -one, uh, in, in terms of racket. So usually implementing such formalisms, it becomes much simpler if you're using a functional programming language. Um, and functional programming is trendy. like. All of these new, all of these well-established programming languages, such as C++, Java, C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, they're all in incorporating functional pro uh, programming idioms, which I've been talking about while I'm showing you um, the various um, features you've been learning, such as streams or um, lambdas and so on. Um, so why should we discourage mutation? We've talked about this for a while, but just to kind of summarize it. Uh, it, it really simplify. It, it's a way to a simpler way to reason about uh, your data structures because there are no surprises when you pass a data structure to some function. You can be sure that no nothing changed uh, under the hood. So you know if you send something to a function, you don't need to copy. You don't need to think about when you copy it or, and so on. Um, so there are no surprises there. It makes parallel code faster. Uh, because there are no race conditions, there's no need to control. If something can never change, you can freely pass it to as many threads as you want, and there's no problem of errors uh, coming up where, where some thread is writing data to your data structure behind your back. Um, so who is using it? Well, a lot of people are using, even in you know programming languages, there are not uh, immutable by design. So uh, there's there's some 
these are just some examples, but there are multiple ones like uh, immutable.js for JavaScript by Facebook. Facebook actually has a lot of um, a lot of Facebook engineers. They work on directly on um, functional programming languages or uh, develop functional programming uh, technologies such as uh, immutable.js. Uh, Facebook even has its own programming language called Reason, which is a functional programming language. Um, so there's this VA, VR, and P collections for uh, Scala, uh, the Scala runtime and the closure runtime, all for Java, uh, which is just a way to write immutable data structures. There's Emer for C++, there's the immutable collection for .NET. So all, a lot of these, um, the idea of immutability is available in your favorite programming language today. Um, and that's because people have realized, th so, and this has been a recent, as in like five, maybe eight years where people have been pushing this for a while, uh, because they are realizing the importance of having immutable data structures in their code. Um, so another thing that people have been, that, that programming languages has been, have been um, importing is the idea of for higher order functions, where the idea where you can pass a function around. Uh, so the idea of a lambda, for instance, that that is something that programming languages like C++, Java, and so on have been incorporating it. Uh, and there are a few reasons why you would prefer it. First of all, because it has a simpler interface than objects, right? You don't know uh, when you have a, an object, you don't know which method should you call. Maybe the order might be unclear because maybe one method might put the the um, the object in a, a inconsistent state that would affect another method the classic example is when you open a file uh, you can only read after you open it but once you close it you can no longer read do you have to open it again and so on so there it's, whenever you have an object there's this notion of internal state uh, and it's not very clear um, how the various methods affect it and so on with a function uh, you have a, a single way. <laughs> There's no other way to call it. Just call the function. Um, and as you've seen, they can be confined, combined very effectively. Um, I showed you a lot of examples such as map, fold, uh, filter, and so on, where you can use um, develop APIs that build on this idea of using functions as values. Um, and this is another thing I was talking about before. I, I mentioned that um, a lot of uh, features have been uh, designed in functional programming languages. For instance, garbage collection, which was created uh, for Lisp in 59. Uh, generics, which are appear first in 1970 and then uh, around, it, they were implemented first in a functional programming language called ML in 77. Uh, so the generics that you use in Java, they've existed in functional programming languages since the end of uh, the end of the seventies. Um, higher order functions, um, which were introduced in Lisp in fifty nine, and in ISWIM in sixty six. So they only now, very recently, have appeared in C plus plus Java and Python. Um, type inference. Um, the auto in C++ and the var in C sharp. I think Java now also has one like that. Uh, and again, this has been around since 69 or something like that. Algebraic data types and pattern matching, which we'll cover in a, few, uh, in a future lesson that has been around since the 70s. Recursion, of course, it's been a big thing of, of Lisp. Um, but there's also a new wave of, of interesting programming languages that are heavily influenced, or they are themselves uh, functional, such as Swift for Apple, uh, Rust, which is a very interesting programming language uh, for system programming, F Sharp, which is a derivative of ML. ML is uh, one of the OGs in, in functional programming languages. Elixir for distributed systems, also pretty cool. And Clojure that uh, works on the JVM and also on the web. It's a pretty cool programming language as well, uh, influenced by, by Lisp. Um, so how are people using uh, functional programming? Uh, OCaml is used in web development, uh, well, by means of Reason, I guess. So Reason is just a syntactic uh, veneer on top of OCaml. 
uh, that's reason is that language designed by or built by Facebook. Um, it's used in distributed systems by Docker, in finance, in Bloomberg, Aesthetic, uh, hardware, and I think Jane Street as well, or I'm sure in Jane Street as well, and hardware virtualization, Citrix. Uh, Haskell has been used a lot by Facebook to uh, check the correctness of uh, Java, uh, Android um, applications, and so on, so to find bugs. Um, it's been used by distributed systems in Go at Google, by compilers at Intel, and distributed systems by Microsoft, or at Microsoft. Um, Erlang uh, is used famously in WhatsApp, uh, in ads by AdRoll, and as web backends by Bet365. It's a very famous betting website. Uh, in finance as well, Elixir has been used a lot in spam prevention, microservices, F-sharp, it's used by Kaggle, Credit Suisse, and GameSys for a gaming backend. Uh, Racket, it's famously used by Naughty Dog, um, and image processing by Upatch, and Scala, and Twitter, Netflix, Tumblr, uh, I don't know if Tumblr still exists, and The Guardian. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of high-profile uh, companies do use functional programming quite a bit. Um, and these are just a few other programming languages. New programming language, ReasonML again, is this one from Facebook. Um, if you're curious, you can click in the HTML version of these slides. Um, okay, in the next video, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, mutable environments, uh, the last bit for um, module 5.